So we read through all of the comments on our videos. Uh, some of the feedback we get from you guys is really good. But I noticed like there's kind of like a, a pattern that I wasn't expecting when we started doing this. And that there's a lot of really young guys, uh, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, that watch these videos. Uh, which I'm kind of surprised at because most of the stuff we do is very old school, you know, the Mopar thing and all of that. And uh, not that we're a Mopar channel, but we have a lot of Mopars. Um, and they ask me questions about their cars, their, their later model cars. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have the technical expertise to answer a lot of those questions. Um, but that's all besides the point. Um, the overwhelming feeling that I get is that a very large percentage of our audience are people... Uh, mostly guys, mostly young guys, but people of all ages who are just really getting their feet wet in the car thing. Um, they're building their first project, or they're uh, you know they're, they're they're dreaming towards it, or you know, but they're they're trying to get a handle on what it's all about. And so that's like that's what I wanted to do with this video. You know, normally we try to keep them kind of short, you know, five minutes, ten minutes at the max. You know, we, we're not whoring for minutes like some of these other channels are. Uh, but this one's probably going to go a little bit of a length, but I think you'll get something out of it because what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to outline how I go about things like these are like my philosophies uh, Now I'll keep it as generic as possible It doesn't matter if you're trying to build you know a drift car or if 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 uh, you know your thing is Honda's or, or you want to build a rock crawler it's it's all the same thing you know it doesn't really make any difference what the object of your of your project or you know direction of your project is but it's more the mindset like what it takes to actually be successful with it so successful with this stuff I'm 56 or 7 I don't even know how old I am but I've been doing this since I'm 15 years old uh, and I've made a living from it, which a lot of guys can't say that they've done. Um, I'm going to share some of that mentality with you. So, you know, um, here's what you have to know about me, right? I'm a real car guy, okay? Meaning that, you know, cars are my universe. My hobby is cars. My business is cars. I relax with cars. Cars are my thing. Cars are my religion. People connect to the universe in all different sorts of ways, all different sorts of practices. Mine is through cars, right? So cars are my total thing. I wake up in the morning, the first thought in my head is cars. While I'm eating, I'm thinking about cars. I'm taking a shower, I'm thinking about cars. The last thought in my mind as I'm going to sleep is cars. It's all cars all the time. That's one of the reasons why I've been able to do what I do. It's a sickness. I have it. You may have it too. Sometimes you've got the sickness and it just needs to be cultivated a little bit. But, you know, the, the bottom line is this. Doing cars, especially a low budget guy, you know, uh, someone who's got very limited resources, you know, they're working out of their house, they're working on the side of their house, or their little one car garage, or, or whatever it happens to be, and no real money and no real tools, you know, this is literally the most difficult thing you can get involved in. It's an all-consuming deal. It looks easy, it seems easy, it dreams easy, but the actual planes going overhead, but the actual practice is difficult. It's all-consuming. You have to be willing and able to throw yourself entirely into it. Narrow your focus. You know, a lot of it is focus. Big part of it is focus. Uh, so with that, let's. I want to show you around some of the cars that we have and, ex and some of the things that I do here and explain the methodology behind each of those things. So, I'm not here to tell you what kind of car to like, what kind of car to build, how to build it or anything like that. Only to use what I do as an example. And one of the first things that I'm going to talk about, and it's probably most controversial for a lot of people, they're not really going to understand it, but pay attention. I stick with one type of car. I stick with one era, one manufacturer. And for me, it's Chrysler products between 1960 and 1980. Why? Well, aside from the fact that I love the cars, I love the machinery, I identify with the design and engineering language of those cars from that period. So basically, you can take any one of those cars, even though they're radically different, 
they're still relatively interchangeable. The torsion bar suspensions, the torque flight transmissions, uh, just the way the things, the electrical systems. I'm familiar with all of these things and I can diagnose them just looking at them. Just I could smell a problem as it goes down the street. I know exactly what's up with these cars. And that goes a long way when you're trying to do something on a grander scale than just you know a tune-up on you know your daily driver. An example of this uh, a month or two ago. Uh, now I like all different cars. I love some of them, but I won't own them. A month or two ago, uh, a '62 Olds Jetfire pops up on Facebook Marketplace, a couple of miles from the house here. This car was beautiful. It was fresh out of the barn, right? Body was there, it was missing some trim. Interior was all sketchy. It had no drivetrain in it. It was that Turbo 215, the aluminum motor, and a four-speed, factory four-speed car. I was like, I gotta have this. I love this car. But then when I started to actually think about what it would take for me to put that car together, it ain't gonna happen. It would cost me thousands and thousands of dollars. It would take me years to hunt up all the parts because I'm out of the loop of that type of car. As much as I want it, as much as, as, as good as my mechanical abilities are, I still, I would be starting from scratch. It would be like me building my first car. I'd have to start learning different forms. I'd have to start memorizing different part numbers. I'd have to learn new systems. I'd have to track down stuff that I have no idea where it is. Mopar stuff, because I've been doing this for so long, you know, I, I have like a, I have a, a psychic intuition. Oh, drive past this guy's house. Like, There's got to be Mopar stuff in his backyard. You tune into, you identify with a certain type of car, a certain brand, and again, see, you could be a Ford guy, you could be a Honda guy, you could be a, an, an American Motors, a Jeep guy, you could be into Mazdas, it doesn't make any difference what you're into. Find that type of car that speaks to you, right? Identify that era, you know what I mean? So let's just, let's just say, for example, and this, this is one of the guys, one of, one of the kids who messaged me, he has a 1975, 1976 Toyota Corolla, he sent me pictures of it, this is going to be his project, right? know the generation of that car. So Toyota, you know, what year did they, they go to that basic car? What year did they stop that basic car? Now you're focused to that generation of Toyotas, that model of Toyotas, and any other Toyotas that are similar to it. And now you're focused down to that, right? I know, you're cutting off a universe of different cars that you love, but you know what? That's why we have friends. Because you'll have friends that have other cars that you're into. Go spend time with them, go work on their stuff, go to the races, go to the shows, go to whatever with their cars. But if you're going to try to build it on your own and you're going to try to build it on a budget, narrow the focus. You can't believe how much you can accomplish if you just tune out all of the outside noise. And, and by noise, I don't mean anything negative. I mean just stuff that isn't what you're exactly into. F narrow down that focus and you could do amazing things. I have 11 cars and trucks. In wrapped up in my 11 cars and trucks, I have less than, I want, I want to say, a lot of people have wrapped up in just their one. And all of my stuff is of the classic era. Now the focus. So narrowing your focus down to one brand and one generation has a lot of economic side benefits. And this starter and this alternator are a perfect example. I have 11 cars and trucks. And out of the 11 cars and trucks, some of them are slant six, some of them are small block, some of them are big block, the Hemi going together. Out of all of my cars, this starter and this alternator will fit each and every one of them. Now some of them have you know, regular Chrysler starters, some of them have the bigger high torque ones, some of them use the, the Chrysler mini starters. But in a pinch, if I need a starter real quick, I can reach on the shelf and I can take this one and I can throw it in any one of my cars and I get it started. This alternator is the same way. It's for a 1970 or newer Chrysler product, but by grounding out one of the field wires, it'll work on any of my 69 and earlier cars. And because it's a double pulley, I, if my car's got AC, it uses the both, the both belts. If it's a non-AC car, it only uses one of the grooves. So this alternator and this starter fit the entire range of everything I own. Now, let's say a set of headers comes along and you know, by using that, I'm not able to use this starter. I've got to use a mini starter. I won't do it. Again, you build it the way you want, but my mentality is I want to simplify the nickels and dimes. The, the, uh, I want everything 
that I need to just keep my cars in motion on the shelf ready to go. I don't want to be in the middle of a task and have to run to the parts store and drop 60 or 70 bucks on a starter or call Jags or Summit and have one sit around my thumb up my ass while I wait for to have the thing delivered. I want these things on the shelf. So hoarding, hoarding the parts that are specific to the generation and make that you're working with. You know, if you find a similar car, let's say pull apart, you can go there, you can grab the headlight switch, you can grab the radio dials, you can grab, you know, any of, you know, the, the voltage regulator or any of the trinkets, the little doodads that are essential to keeping those cars running. You get it, you put it on your shelf. Over time, the nickel and dime savings by doing things this way, you can't believe the difference. The next thing in my mind is, is also crucial. And it's kind of like the foundation of like my, my whole you know, mentality. Purity of purpose, all right? When I put a car, go back to that, right? Purity of purpose. When I was a little kid, before I knew anything technical about cars, I was originally attracted to dragsters, slingshot dragsters, because they were so pure, right? Uh, they did nothing. They, could, they were incapable of doing anything except go fast in a straight line. As I got a little bit older and started to become more sophisticated, the thing that turned me on even more about those cars was that it took a couple of people to start them. And the starter actually had to plug in. It wasn't even something that was on the car. It was that helpless that it could only do this one thing. I love this. Later on when I started working with funny cars, the kick I used to get out of those was that if you turn the steering wheel with the car sitting still, the wheels won't move. You actually have to go out to the, to the wheels and move the wheels to change the direction of the car. I know. Everybody wants something that does everything. You want a car that's perfect in every way, shape, and form. But here's the thing, okay? Heavyweight boxers make terrible figure skaters. And figure skaters, they die in a boxing ring, okay? So, yeah, there are triathletes out there. But triathletes, they have to focus and they have to, I mean, like, it's, it's a thousand percent what they need to do in order to, you know what I mean? That's it. Their diet, their everything has to be pinpoint exact to do all of these different things and they never excel at any one specific deal. So if you're talking about cars, cars are the same way, right? If you want a car that does everything, right? It accelerates good, it stops good, it turns good, it does all of these things good, right? It's not going to do anything exceptionally well, and it's going to cost you a fortune trying to make it do all of these different things, and it'll never excel at any given one thing. So you build a car that, let's say, um, you can autocross and take it to the drag strip. Well, I mean, okay, that's great. Except that when it's set up for the drag strip, it won't autocross. And when it's autocrossing, you, you take it to the drag strip, and it's just going to spin the tires. So it means you have to have different sets of tires for the thing, different suspension settings. Your learning curve for each thing has to be completely different. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. What I'm saying is it's not for me. If I narrow my focus to the purity of purpose of the car that I'm working on, right? I get a car that will do exactly what I want it to do or represent exactly what I want it to represent the best way it possibly can. This Roadrunner is a good example. So I wanted a car that was representative. This was a nostalgic thing. I wanted a car that was representative of the New York City street rat that I grew up with in you know the, the, the 1970s, 1980s. So, when we set about building this car, that's exactly what I did. There isn't a single nut or bolt on this thing. Nothing that's newer than 1980. Everything is of that era. And I did it because it doesn't just represent the era, it actually is the era. You know, I work on this car, I drive this car, I do anything with this car, and it's 1977. You know, it smells like 1977, it sounds like 1977, it runs like 1977. It is 1977. It's not your trip, it's my trip. And I enjoy it just the way it is, purity of purpose. But each of my vehicles represents that sort of purity of purpose. And, it, and it's not always something that's so over the top. Like for instance, I have a, a 1964 Dart, Mrs. Landy, right? And my purpose for that car? Well, okay, so this is the car when I was a teenager that the badasses had, right? But that's the car when I was a teenager that everybody had in high school parking lot. You know, six cylinder with, a, with a, a, a thrush muffler on it and, you know, slot mags 
and every little bit of JC Whitney dude there that you could every little chrome thing, you know, the little tack mounted on the steering column and the footsy gas pedal and the you know, well, that's what I do with that car and I get the biggest kick out of it. Or it's just it's exactly the car that was in my high school parking lot in 1977. Um, I also have this 73 Roadrunner over here. Uh, it's 344 speed car. And that car, I wanted something that was just stock muscle car. Something that has the look, the feel, the smell, the sound, everything of just, you know, a 1970s muscle car. I like the way, uh, I, I just like the vibe of those type of cars. And, you know, so the purity of that car is just that. If it wasn't part of the, the 1970s, early 1970s muscle car thing, and it wasn't, let's say, you know, uh, dealer available or, you know, day two type of stuff, not hot rod, just slight tweaks, that's what that car is. It looks, feels, sounds, drives, smells like a 1970s muscle car. All of my vehicles have that mentality. I've got that Sun 6 Dart. I, I, okay, so I spent a dozen years playing with blown nitro cars. You know, every time you turn around, it's this huge expense. Back then it was $1,000 a run. Everything was death defying, right? It's like, ugh, I don't want to deal with it. So I built this six cylinder dart along the lines of a late 1960s gasser, you know, with holes drilled everywhere and just everything super lightweight. And a slant six. And the thing will run in like the 12s or we'll run in the high 11s if I'm lucky. But, you know, it's like completely carefree fun. It's just like, okay, blow it up, no problem. Here's another $25 slant six. Let's carve it up and throw it back in there and go back out again. So it's like when I build a car, when I set it to build a car, each car has an exact, exact purpose. I have one car, this orange Swinger that I drive every day, that we built only because I needed a car with air conditioning. We wanted to make a road trip up to Michigan. It was summertime. I, I, we needed something that had AC. So I grabbed up all of these parts of shells, fenders, and interior parts, and, engine, and, and spent a couple of weeks and glommed this car together. And its only purpose is that it had AC. So we equipped the car with all of the other things that a car with AC should have. It has power steering, you know. It's a, it's a comfortable, you know, road car. It's got, you know, 270 gears in it and a 318, a dead stock 318. And it's a perfect daily driver. It goes out every day of its life and it does battle in the streets of, of Murfreesboro, Nashville, Tennessee. And it's fine. So each of my cars has a very specific purpose. When you're looking at the project that you want to build, right, find the essence. What of that car talks to you, you know? What action, what activity fits that car best? And narrow your focus down to that activity or, or, or that purpose. And you'll get the best, the best results, the biggest bang for your buck is going to come that way. So I could go on and on about my cars and why I do certain things to my cars and you know, also, you know, avoiding fads and trends is another thing too. You know, a lot of guys get sucked into that. They see the trend, you know, whatever it is they're showing on the TV or showing in the magazines or whatever the, the hot thing at SEMA is this year, right? And they say, oh, that's how I'm going to build my car. But you know what? It's hopelessly out of date and usually before you finish building it. Forget trends, you know, go with the classics or, or lean towards the classics, timeless things. Timeless things are just that, they're timeless. And it's a matter of value too. You could sink an ungodly amount of time and money into the fad car, but as soon as the fad is passed, it's done, right? But find a good day two muscle car. Find a legitimate like 1960s gasser, you know? Uh, find even like a, 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 a 70s van, you know, like a survivor type of 70s van. These things are, this is money in the bank. This just goes up and up and up. So stick with the classics and stick with the, uh, stick with the proven, the time proven things. Um, that's the car part of it. But then there's also your environment, right? Which, as you can see by watching these videos, we do most of our work here at the house. And I work, okay, my lifestyle would probably be better suited if I lived in the stick someplace. The dogs are going nuts, aren't they? That's all part of it. We've got four of them, and every once in a while they just get into this howling match with each other. So. My lifestyle, let's walk over there. My lifestyle would definitely be better suited if I lived in the sticks, but I live in subdivisions. I've always lived in subdivisions. 
I like the convenience. I like having people and things around. Subdivision is not the best place to build a car. Um, and the way I do it, the way I survive, is I am the best neighbor you could possibly be, right? They're having a problem with their lawn, or I'll run over and throw a plug in it. Uh, anything with their car, boom, I'm right there. I answer questions. I smile at everybody. I wave at everybody. I keep my cars in front of the house. I work on them, but as soon as I'm done, I clean the mess up. I never leave parts laying around. I never leave, you know, things and tools, unless it's absolutely necessary. It's a very rare occurrence that I'll leave something out where the neighbors can see it. I do as much as I can in the backyard behind the privacy fence. I try to be quiet and try to be respectful of what's going on during dinner time. Uh, you know, they're watching TV or whatnot. Every once in a while, yeah, you have to make a racket. But these are the same people who you see in the morning and you wave and you say, hey, good morning, how you doing? Hey, you making a racket last night? Yeah, I know, I'm sorry about that. Oh, don't worry about it, it's no big deal. We know you're having fun. I mean, you've always got that one disgruntled asshole who's going to hate you just because you're enjoying life, you know? They're going to call codes, they're going to call cops. Let me tell you something, right? Back in the 1990s when I lived in New York City, I lived in a house exactly like the one I do now. And I ran a full-service shop out of a two-car garage. I had two full-time guys working for me. I had the local Ford dealer they used to send me the cars they couldn't figure out. They used to send me to my house and I do them over here at the house. I had car dealers, I had all types of people who were using my services. My game was so tight that somebody had kept calling codes. My game was so tight that the code guy came. I think his name was Nate, right? The code guy came. And instead of shutting me down, he started sending me his family's cars. I was working for the enemy, right? By maintaining that kind of like, you know, rapport with my neighbors and, you know, because you run out of the house and uh, you could do it cheap, you don't have to rob people, you know? You don't have to go poke it for every little, little nickel and dime. You don't have to sell them stuff they don't need. You could be completely honest with them. And that honesty is what kept my business going. It's what kept me, you know, it paid my bills. Just being honest, just being friendly. And you know, it's not like I was working cut rate either. I got top dollar for every service that I performed. I just didn't perform unnecessary services. But again, see, going back to the environment, you want to keep everything as low key as you can. But when it is, when it does have to be out there, you know, just make sure you got that extra little smile and wave. Good rapport with your neighbors, you know, good rapport with the local cops. You know, when you pass a cop, right, wave at him, wave at him. Show him, hey, you know, I'm okay, I'm on your side. He's not going to turn around and bust your chops because your car is loud, you know. He's going to wave back, right. It's all these little things. This is how you survive. This is how you're able to, you know, move effortlessly through society and still do your crazy car thing you got to know your limitations so obviously if you're working out of a subdivision rolling your rotisserie out into the street and sandblasting the thing isn't going to be part of the program so you've got to work around those things and you also have to realize that these are your limitations you have to know yourself you have to know what it is that you want or what you're capable of like for instance I love original restored cars, right? Uh, Hemi Cudas, you know, show me, a, show me a, a beautiful old Jag, right? I mean, I love these things, but I'm not a meticulous person. I can't maintain something like that. I can't provide it the, the, the climate controlled environment, you know? I can't exercise the self-control of only driving on a special certain sunny occasions, right? I, or, and, and not beating it to death. So I don't own stuff like that. I love it. I love that other people own it. I appreciate what they do. But I know it's not part of my program. I can't do it. Economics is the same thing. Manpower is the same thing. Like, for instance, let's say you want to go you want to go race. You want to go chase the street outlaws around the country, right? Okay, so let's just say that you can scrape together the $150,000 or so it takes to even just get started in a program like that. Are you ready, willing, and able to work 18 hours a day, seven days a week to maintain that thing? Are you ready to bounce all across the country? Can you afford to bounce all across the country? Can you feed this thing thousands of dollars every week just to stay on, you know, on program, right? Because that's what it takes to run cars at a level like that. It's one thing to dream it. It's another thing to live it. You really need to know. A lot of us guys, we work by ourselves. There is no help. Do you have 
friends that and 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 can you afford a crew if you can't afford a crew do you have friends and family that will make up a crew can these people drop what they're doing and run across the country with you you know these are all things you got to think about before you actually get started on a program you have to know your limitations and you have to know yourself what are you capable of my cars they all have to live outside i have a thing for like I know it sounds, you know, like out of character. I love like Chicano lowriders. I would love to have something like that. I can't afford it. I mean, even if I could afford the paint, you know, even if I had the skills to do something like that, I can't maintain it. It has to live outside. Birds are going to shit on this thing. The sun is going to bake it. Kids are going to throw balls at it. You know, it, it, I can't do it. So I appreciate it. I love it. I see what other people do, but I know my limitation. I can't do that. So I don't. You need to know the same thing about yourself. The last thing, no question, it's the most important thing, and that's education. Now, don't get me wrong, I have zero regard for the education system in this country. I got thrown out of school when I was 16, and I never looked back. That's not the kind of education I'm talking about. What you have to understand about the car thing, right, is that Every system interacts with every other system. There is no change you can make in one area of the car that won't affect some other area of the car or its function. And unless you have that balance right, you'll never have a car to perform or do what you want it to do. So you need to educate yourself. You need to learn each of these systems. And you need to basically imagine the package before you start to put it together. You want to use this engine in this body with this rear end and that transmission and it's going to... You need to know all of the details of each of those systems and then how you're going to holistically join them together to, to create a homogenous package that's going to produce what you want to produce. Watch videos, you know, obviously. Watch videos. Watch our videos. Any aspect of the car that you're that you're working on at any given time, read it. If you start talking about you, you're looking into let's say camshafts, right? Well, they're going to recommend what converter to use, right? So start looking at converters. They're going to say what gear to use. Start looking at gears. Start, you know, put the whole car together in your mind before you start to put it together physically, and learn each of those systems. Read. I mean. I, I can't stress that enough, right? It, it, there's this physics, there's math, there's, I mean, everything is all involved in it. And you don't, you, it's not like you have to go to school and learn broad, you know, the broad spectrum of physics, but you do need to know how physics affect the various things that you're working with, you know? Uh, I always had, I always had a biggest problem with, with Newton's first law of motion, you know? Uh, that, that, you know, a body at rest stays at rest until, uh, you know, acted upon by an outside force. Until I realized, I was the outside force, you know? So it's like all of these things come together. You know, the car thing, is a, it's a thinking man's game. And it's a difficult game. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, you've really got to love this stuff. you got to devote yourself to it to, you know, to, to get anything out of it at all. Uh, and for some people, it's just a hobby. And there's nothing wrong with it just being a hobby, you know? But uh, I don't think anybody really ever looks at something like this and says, oh, I'm just going to do this at an enjoyable level. No, you know, you want to make it the most out of it, you know. Uh, there's very few things, in, there are very few challenges in, in, in everyday life that, you know, uh, can match what you can get from the world of cars. You know, and, and motorcycles too. I don't mean to take, I mean, bikes are a big part of, were a big part of my life for a long time. Uh, vehicles. It takes a special type of crazy, right? You know, you're talking about something that, you know, the, it took it took an assembly line and hundreds of people, you know, to put this thing together. And now you're going to take it all apart and rearrange it for your purposes. You know, it's a special type of crazy or it's a special type of stupid. But, you know, we share that. So, uh, at any rate, take this brother and me. It serves you well.